All righty, welcome back. This week we're studying the Brachiopoda, one of the most amazing phyla of fossils ever. Just the sheer numbers, I mean, more than something like 30,000 of these things are known from the rock record. Although these days there's only several hundred today. So what happened to them? And if we think about it even more, like in the past, these crazy brachiopods that we'll talk about uh, lived all over the place. They dominated warm, shallow seas, even into deep water. Nowadays, they're pretty much known just for kind of cold water Arctic regions, um, and their former niches have been supplanted by the mollusks. And a lot of people think brachiopods look like mollusks. In fact, at home, I've got this cool old poster from the 1800s from a textbook that actually shows brachiopods as being part of uh, the mollusca. Uh, but as we'll learn, they're not. And so, uh, yeah, this week we're going to learn all about these crazy brachiopods brachiopods, brachiopods that look like mollusks, but aren't mollusks. Now, the other thing I want to say is that um, when I was preparing to my notes for this uh, lecture, I was thinking, I, I was looking at YouTube and, and well, yeah, YouTube, and I was looking at some websites too, but YouTube, there's amazing stuff out there. And, and if you do a quick search, you'll find way better talks than this one it just is. Um, because here's the deal. I'm going to be talking in this video about what a geologist should know about brachiopods as part of my paleontology course I teach at Chico State. Um, it's not the end all on biology. I'm not a biologist. So I'm not going to give that lecture. I'll give a little bit of the biology, enough of what I think a geologist should think about when they come across a brachiopod in the field. And uh, nuances on the tiny little bits that are so important for naming uh, brachiopods. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into that. There's lots of other resources on there. I want this to be kind of the, an introduction so you get a basic amount of what you should know about brachiopods. That's my goal. All right. And so um, to start with, um, where people always start in these classes is why aren't brachiopods mollusks? Both are bivalves, meaning that the animal has developed an exoskeleton, an outside shell, really kind of a mesoskeleton, we won't worry about that. Uh, but anyways, a shell of calcium carbonate, sometimes calcium phosphate, to enclose their body. And there's two shells. But that's where it ends, because mollusks are essentially this enormous hyperactive ball of meat inside of, of two shells. And brachiopods are like barely functioning, really low energy. They have really low oxygen needs. Um, so that's for starters. If you're going to go out for you, 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 clam chowder, right? There, there's all kinds of mollusk foods out there. Nobody ever serves you like brachiopods. I mean, there's just nothing to eat there. There's not much there. But what is there is amazing because brachiopods, along with another phylum in my class we'll discuss later, the bryozoans, have this unique organ that is unmatched anywhere else in the animal kingdom. It's called a lophophore. And the lophophore is this spirally shaped thing that serves as an arm to grab food and filter it down to the mouth because brachiopods are suspension feeders. They eat phytoplankton out of the water column. But wait, not only are you a grabbing eating thing, this lophophore, it's your lung too the brachiopoda. And so they have this breathing, eating organ, pretty weird, pretty unique, not found anywhere else. And that's why we think they're all linked and also linked with uh, bryozoans and some other uh, groups. Cool. So why do people keep wanting to make the mollusks then if their bodies are so different? It's this bivalve shell. So here's the deal. Here is a soap dish I stole from our kitchen this morning. Look at that beauty. Looks like a clam, doesn't it? It's not a clam. It's not a clam because this is one of those shells. And if you drew a line down the middle of the shell this way, in the, the median part of the shell, the left half and the right half are together. That's typically what you see with a brachiopod. Here's a fossil brachiopod. And along that same midline, it's the same left and right. Meanwhile, if you take a clam shell, and you divide that in half, yeah, the, the two sides aren't exactly lined up. They are asymmetrical, asymmetrical around a midline of the shell. Now, the difference is if you take a clam shell and you look at it along its hinge, whether the front or the back, the two shells are, they are symmetrical. So 
bi clam, the true bivalvia, are symmetrical along a plane where the shells meet. If we go back to our brachiopod here I just grabbed, it's kind of hard to tell a little bit. There's the shell. Like this is all one shell that you're seeing. The other shell is just tucked inside here. And so brachiopods, the two shells are asymmetrical. Another way to think about that is with your hands, if you put your hands together, your hands look the same. Jeez, my hands look horrible. Anyways, there's, there's the hands. They're the same and they hinge. That's like a clam, symmetrical around the hinge line. Whereas brachiopods, they're symmetrical the other way. Here's a quick sketch on the board. So here we see from where I drew it, again, the brachiopod symmetrical around the midline, but asymmetrical between the two valves. And if we look at the clams, we see the opposite, where asymmetric around the two valves, but symmetric along the hinge line. Now, this is the easy way to tell them apart, at least in the fossil record. But really what's more important is the biology. As I mentioned, um, Mollusks are very complicated. There's a lot of meat. There's a lot of need. They, they're high energy usage. And frankly, they're active predators for the most part. Uh, brachiopods are have a lot less interior except for this amazing lophophore. Uh, and they have very, very low oxygen needs. So although they're bivalve, they actually live pretty differently in the, in, in the, in the um, environment. And so um, it's been a fascinating thing to think about dominance over time. For instance, if we look at the rock record of brachiopods versus mollusks, we see this interesting pattern. Now, for starters, don't use this as verbatim. This is, again, a geologist. I said at the beginning, a geologist view of just collecting fossils and hiking and mapping over the years. What I've noticed is that brachiopods, both brachiopods and bivalves are found in the Cambrian. But throughout the Paleozoic, from the Cambrian to the Permian, you are absolutely dominated by brachiopods. If you were to walk on a beach, you'd find blocks of brachiopods. Um, here's a sample I just collected from the Devonian. And it's just a block of chaka full of brachiopods. And I could pick up any of the numbers of these pieces around here, and you will find loads and loads of brachiopods. As we cross into that Permian-Triassic extinction, brachiopods take a big hit and they dwindle and dwindle. And they're around today again, but really, really low reduced numbers. Bivalves, the clams, yeah, you can find them throughout. And there's some times like in the Devonian where you see some pretty amazing ones. Um, and then, in the but once you cross that Permian boundary, we really see bivalves take off and some amazing diverse and, 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 and I'm, I'm, there's so much to talk about with bivalves, but if you squint as a geologist, the Paleozoic dominated by these sessile benthic suspension feeders, like the brachiopods, and then the Mesozoic and Cenozoic dominated by the active predator bivalves. And so their lives are really, really different. All righty. So again, geologists doing biology. Let's talk about these brachiopods. So there were many ways they attached, and some of them didn't actually attach. They were still sessile and benthic, but they had just flipped themselves upside down and attached the spines to the seabed. But the classic brachiopod animal cut in half here is attached by a tube to the substrate called the pedicle. And when we look at a brachiopod, let's see, I've got one here. Again, there's your beautiful symmetry, little wing guy, spurriferate. And if you look at it up close, notice that the valve on top is bigger. In fact, if I do it by the picture, see if I can do it like this. The top part has that little pokey bit that sticks over the top. The pedicle valve drawn on the top here is typically the larger valve. We call that the pedicle or the ventral valve. And the lower one is the brachial valve which is the dorsal valve. Now, that's another thing. If I take a step back, clams, if, if my body were a clam's body, right? So we have our, our uh, anterior, our posterior, our tummy, our ventral surface, and our back, our dorsal surface, then a clam has its, its um, hinge along the back. And so the clam shell closes like this. And so that hinges along the dorsal surface, one side of the clam, is posterior the other side is anterior but with a brachiopod okay the um the two shells are they are um hinged sideways so with a brachiopod shell it's more like the hinges on the bottom and the shells close over 
And so the one shell is the actual valve. I drew it. So in this way, it'd be kind of like if that were you, you'd be upside down trying to do your dorsal and ventral, but that's the way the biology is. Okay, let's move beyond that. Here's the cool thing to look at here with this picture is when you cut open, remember I said before, mollusks are big piles of meat and brachiopods are not. If you cut open a brachiopod shell, most of that space, what we call the mantle cavity is open. It won't be for long, but, it, but for now, just picture it being open. The backside of that brachiopod shell, that's the body cavity. And what I've drawn here is the mouth going into kind of a gut and that's its digestive thing. And then the brachiopod uses that body cavity to fill in all the rest of the stuff it needs, like the gonad and a heart to pump blood through. And actually brachiopod blood is clear. Is that kind of weird? Now, so we can eat, we can make babies, we can pump blood. Oh, we need to breathe. This comes our amazing loaf of four. A little pathetic, but that's about the best I can draw for, again, this organ that twists around has cilia because it's both filtering, it's drawing, by the cilia moving, it's drawing water in through the opening. And uh, that water allows it to take in particles, phytoplankton to eat. But it's also where the breathing happens because the oxygen diffuses across this and that's what fuels the brachiopod. This is a good example of why the shells may look the same, and so we want to lump them together, but biologically totally different groups. There's one other special thing, if I can erase this part of the brachiopod, I want to show you one more biological thing. Now, let's go back to our clam friend here. If we look at the inside of the clam, I've highlighted this circular depression here. There's another one here. Those are muscle scars, because when the clam, clams naturally want to be open. And that has to do with with the uh, uh, the hinge, and so they have muscles to pull themselves closed, and they're called adductor muscles. Well, brachiopods also have adductor muscles, and so there's the adductor muscle. However, brachiopods have another muscle called the diductor muscle, and this diductor muscle is what um, what closes the brachiopod, and so I'm sorry, opens. The diductor muscle is what opens the brachiopod. And so here's what's interesting is that when clam, when bivalves uh, die and their muscles shrivel up, they tend to open up. That's why if you walk on beaches, you find these butterfly or open up shells. Brachiopods, when they die, they tend to close. And so the vast majority of fossils we find in the rock record of brachiopods are closed. And so we have to take that into account when we're thinking about taphonomy and paleoecology. All right, let's get into more about brachiopods. So you'll often see on the web and doing research and, and in books still, you hear the words inarticulate and articulate brachiopod. That's an old way of thinking about brachiopods, about whether at their hinge zone they have teeth or not. And the idea is that that's what broke out the divisions of brachiopods. That's not really true and we don't use that anymore. So don't use it. It's like saying palesopod or tertiary. Don't say tertiary. It's gone. I'm sorry. It's kind of like Pluto, but we, we just can't use it anymore. So uh, let's look at the real division of brachiopods. Brachiopods can be broken down into three groups based on mainly their scale mineralogy, which we think is the inherited trait, and then secondarily by their teeth. So let's join the 21st century. Brachiopods can be broken down into the linguliforme, the craniiforme, and the rhynchanelliforme. And these first two are what were mostly, but not entirely, lumped into as the old inarticulates. The linguliforme includes a genus lingula, which is one that's talked about a lot in the books because, do I have one right here? I don't have one right here. If I had one right here, I'd show it to you. Um, so I'll have to do it like that. And um, lingula in the Cambrian goes all the way back to the Cambrian, and the, the genus is still found today. It's in burrows, and um, often in burrows, and um, it looks the same. Something about it, it looks perfect. And so um, these have, have a calcium phosphatic shell. Also included in the lingua forme are like the acrotritidids. And um, here's an example of a non-lingua, but a lingua forme. And they, they often look like, to me, like broken fingernails on the rock, like this black smashed structures with nice rings to them. Now, the craniiforme are pretty rare, and they don't often have them in school collections like ours because they're really tiny. I'm trying to get one right here. This little guy here with my makes God makes my fingers look huge. There's my eyeball. Uh, that's craniops, 
And craniops is an example of the lingula formae. And I think about um, craniaforme being kind of early Paleozoic for the most part. Now, the vast majority of brachiopods you're going to find are the Rancanella formae. These are like the classics. And what can I say? I took paleontology from the amazing William Miller at Humboldt State, go lumberjacks. And we memorized all these different groups of brachiopods and took exams and learned all that stuff. And it's all gone. It's gone. Because even though there's only a few hundred brachiopods left today, the um, specialists can do the DNA and look at cladistics. Now, in the old way, we use what are called phylogenetic trees, and people group brachiopods together by their amazing biology. I'm sorry, they group them together by their amazing shell structures. I'll get to that in a second. The point about the shell structures is we now know those are homeomorphs, or the idea that different unrelated groups can evolve to look the same. And so just using a certain particularly exterior uh, uh, shell structure uh, will not, it's not valid for making groups. And so I learned them back in the, those old ways. Um, but nowadays with genetics, they've realized that they could break things out into more realistic groups, which include the ancestor and all the descendants using cladistics. And so um, the Rankia nelliforme in general are, they have calcium carbonate skeletons. They have good teeth structures. Oh, good, what's a bad tooth structure? I don't know, it's a tooth structure. Tooth structures. And just all I can say right now from my class is an amazing diversity of forms. We're not going to cover it all. There's books out there. There's the web out there to learn the names of all these forms. What I will say from my experience in working with brachiopods, is it's easy to look at external features, but you really, really need the internal features, especially if you're going to try to actually name something down to species level. And what the internal features show on a brachiopod are things like where the muscles attached, but more importantly, in that brachial valve, sometimes in the pedicle valve, but usually in that brachial valve, is the, the actual calcium carbonate supports that hold up the lophophore. And they really vary from spiral looking structures to among uh, some of the rancanella formae, the rancanellids. There's like two arms that stick out from the back of the shell. Looking cool. They're called crura and they hold up that structure. And then even among crura, there's different ways that they are shaped and that's how they can define the different groups. Sometimes the shells have a medial septa running down, usually like the dorsal backside or a septalium. There's loads and loads of features. And if you get into that, um, uh, you can start to tell them apart. What I want to do here in the next few minutes, though, is tell you kind of the most critical, I think, again, for a geologist of how to tell brachiopod shells apart. So the first thing is looking at that kind of holding out one of these shells sideways and what do they look like? Many of the brachiopods have two convex or a biconvex shell. Some have one flat shell and another convex called a pinoconvex shell. And then some of them, like these guys here, these strophomonitids, have, um, well, it's called resupinate, or I call it potato chip shell, where one shell is nice and smooth convex, and the other one actually dips under inside of it. And I tried to draw that with a dashed line. I think about it like if you were at a party and you wanted to have a chip to dip dip out of, resupinate shells would be the ones to go through. You can get the most out of them. So, and there's other forms, but this is just at least getting your brain thinking about the different kinds of shells to describe. And again, this is a short video. You can go to the books to get more. Uh, let's look at the hinge. First thing is that you realize that many of the brachiopod shells, and I've got one here somewhere. Here we go have a a where the shell the the i could have picked a better one but anyways the shell comes to a really narrow tip which i tried to sketch here that's known as an astrophic hinge other brachiopods have a long flat like the sporiferids here's a good example of one with it where the hinge is really long oh look it almost fits perfectly didn't mean to do that. That's called a strophic hinge. So astrophic versus strophic hinges, good ways to divide up brachiopods. And now if we look at the hinge itself, some brachiopods attach the pedicle through a hole, the terebratulids, and we call that the pedicle foreman. Really obvious, really helps it to jump out. Other ones, they still have a pedicle valve and a brachial valve, but the pedicle actually attaches to a, an opening, which often gets closed by a series of plates. Sometimes uh, I've seen some brachiopods where in the juvenile stages, it's open 
attached by a pedicle, then maybe they were more free living on the surface because that closes up with a series of plates. Uh, for instance, deltherial plates would be one example. So here I've drawn a picture looking back, showing the open deltherium, and then in the other shell, the nototherium. Again, if you get into the taxonomy, you'll learn these different parts and how to tell them apart. Here, for example, here's a brachiopod, shows one of those really nice pedicle foramens. Look at that giant hole up there. And here we see one of the open deltherium now filled with dirt. And I highlighted it with a triangle so you can see where it came through. Now, the other thing for describing brachiopods is on the front side, we just talked about the hinge. On the front side where it closes, actually all the way around where it closes, that's known as the commissure or the commissure line. And in some brachiopods, it's nice and even. In other ones, it's a zigzag or known as a zigzag commissure. And if you follow that zigzag through its growth stages of the brachiopod, you'll see a corrugation or what we call um, ribs or costae. Uh, depending on the size. There, now I've drawn them so you can see these ribbing. Okay, so that's the zigzag commissure, flat or zigzag. But the other thing that, that defines some of the brachiopod groups is the shell itself will get uh, folds in them. Now, technically, the shell that, uh, that pushes up into a fold, that is the fold. The other shell is actually going down going down, I guess it's upside down, and that's a sulcus. So this is a brachiopod that shows a fold and a sulcus. Here's what I just collected, actually, about a week ago. I don't know what it is. I think it's the genus Leorhynchus. I got to figure this out. This is from the Femenian in Morocco, and so I, I don't know those fossils well. But if we hold, here's the hinge. If we look at the front of it, look at that immense fold coming up, and then the sulcus and the other shell. Um, that's why I think it's Leorhynchus. And there's someone also, by the way, zigzag commissure with really nice costae growing around it. In contrast, um, this is the brachiopod after my heart. Uh, this is uh, the genus Jejuzitskia from the Devonian. Look at the size of this monster. Just dropped it. Uh, but if we look at it up close, this one... Notice it has a sulcus. And actually, if we if this was better preserved on the bottom side, I had one earlier and I forgot to bring it. Um, it it's what we call bisulcate. So some of them have a have no fold, but they have two sulcuses on either side. By the way, Jejuzitskia is a Rhinconella. It's among one of the largest brachiopods. And for a final one, this is here's a back the little spirifrid I have here on with me. If you look at it up close, I hold it this way, you could see the fold on the top and the sulcus on the bottom. And that's the best way to tell them apart. Again, if you really are going to do systematics, you have to cut them open and look at them inside. Well, um, I truly love brachiopods. These days, they're among my favorite fossils for sure. I've spent some time uh, researching them. I wish I could talk more, but I'm going to keep this short. Uh, but as always, if you want to see the notes that actually go to my class, if you've just stumbled on this video on YouTube, please hit me up. Just email me at California State University Chico. You can find me. There's not many of us here. And um, I'd be happy to share with you the more extensive notes I give to the students. Uh, so takeaway points, though. Here we go. Brachiopods absolutely dominate the Paleozoic, which is why we find like big blocks of them. Or when you're in the field, you stumble across just giant boulders of them. It was the seabed. They really get wiped out in the Ordovician. They get another wipe out in the Devonian. Groups start dropping off and off and off. And then by the time you hit the Permian Triassic, they're pretty much done for. And they dribble through uh, and, and are very low represented today. Mollusks seem to have taken over their niche, but it's way more complicated than that. And lots of amazing research is still to come on that brachiopod to mollusk transition, but they are not mollusks. They have the same bivalve structure, but they have a different and totally different biology inside. And so keep that in mind and sound smart. Don't say inarticulate and articulate brachiopod. By God, that's old. We've, we've moved beyond that. And the only way we're going to move forward in really studying evolution and extinction patterns is to really kind of group these animals the way they're supposed to be. If you're a geologist, though, and you're finding a brachiopod in the field and you want to know the age of it, somebody just brought me one actually the other day, and I thought I had it here and I didn't. Um, so we're going to just not worry about that part. Uh, 
Uh, whole shells are great. Again, to really get species, they'd have to be cut to look at the inside. But typically, if we know a region and we look at the outside, we can give you the age date. Hope you enjoyed brachiopods. We'll see you next week.